Welcome back, everyone. Today, we have a very special episode with Jenny Bailey, conservationist and co-founder of Tales from Mother Earth. She's one half of the partnership who has developed this agile idea for Tales from Mother Earth. It's music and stories that ignite the conservationist in all of us. By compiling a touching series of realistic animal and insect children's stories, they aim to raise the awareness of the plight our natural world is facing in these uncertain times of climate change, erosion of natural habitat, and plastic pollution. Through active learning, their books are aimed to educate and inspire the young. Their collective mission is to collaborate and bring about a lasting change, one that will encourage wildlife to prosper and one that will ultimately benefit us all. Jenny has been very busy writing the stories and promoting their first book, Phoebe the Bee, which teaches children the importance of bees and how much they do for us. Each book is accompanied with a CD where the story is read by Mother Earth and there is also a read-along feature, beautiful illustrations and original theme and feature music. Providing puzzle pages, fun facts, top action tips that the reader is encouraged to take part in with the aim of helping the natural world, the conservation message is reinforced throughout. All these elements combine to produce a great tool that is sure to educate and delight all who read it. So please join me in enjoy, and enjoy this episode of Agile Ideas with Tales from Mother Earth author and co-founder Jenny Bailey. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny Bailey from Tales from Mother Earth for joining us today on the Agile Ideas podcast. Looking forward to having a really detailed conversation about all things about Tales from Mother Earth. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you, Fatima. It's lovely to be here. Um, I guess it's morning out with here and it's obviously evening with you guys. So I hope you're having a great evening out there. We are. We just finished daylight savings, so it's getting darker much sooner. So you might notice that the background starts dimming a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So much, um, so much things. I just think we we can't ignore the elephant in the room. There's a lot of things going on in in the world right now. Um, there's a lot of sort of sad stories in in the world with the virus and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to know: is there any coping strategies that you've come across maybe during this time that you could share with others? Maybe something you or your family have come across. I don't know if it's a coping strategy necessarily, but um, we are still allowed outside to exercise and we as a family um, use that time and, and walk um, on the paths and in, in the parks. And it's it's lovely to be outside. And when we are outside, it's it's, it's special time, I guess, really. Um, and the other coping strategy really is the fact that it's 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 a very difficult time that we're all going through. But in a way, we're we're all together. We're safe in our home, and we're we're playing games, and we're doing jigsaws, and we're obviously I'm homeschooling as well. So we're going through those processes, um, which can be fairly challenging at times with a nine-year-old and eleven-year-old. Um, but I think it's just in a way enjoying that time together. We're, we're not going to get this time again. So it's yeah. almost flipping it on its head and realizing this is precious time. The education of the children can, needs to continue, obviously. Um, but when we do manage to get outside and go for our walk, we're taking extra deep breaths these days because we're obviously not allowed out that often. So when we do go out, we're really filling our lungs with the fresh air. And the air does seem to be much fresher out there, which is lovely. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think having that time with family and spending time where most of us don't get the opportunity to be with our family as much as we'd like because of work situations, um, mm. I think is really valuable. Um, what was the best thing that happened to you last week? Well, last week we went on a walk and we kind of do the loop where we cross uh, past the house uh, probably about twice or three times because we don't want to go that far away. Um, but there's a particular um, walk where we go past like um, a lots of trees um, and we just happen to look down and obviously I'm into the nature and very much and the wildlife and everything. And we just saw lots of different types of bees. There must have been about five or six different types of bees. And there's, there's thousands of different types of bees in the world. But to actually see that and to see them going about their business. Um, and so I brought the kids in and we all had our little um, phones so we could take pictures of them. Um, and just to see the variety that was there. And they were all going about their business and being incredibly happy and incredibly um, dexterous in what they were doing. Um, it just made us feel a little bit happier and, and the fact that, yes, we are going through an incredibly difficult time and we all need to do all we can to save lives. 
um, and, and to take everybody's um, considerations and look after everybody. Um, but, but outside, it's almost business as usual, if you like, for nature and wildlife. Yeah. And, and to see them just carrying on because they need to reach, well, bees in particular, need to reach about 2,000 flowers per day um, wow. to make what they need to make back at their hives and, and everything. So it, it was quite incredible to know that we're on lockdown. We're, we're stopping at the moment. We're, everything has stopped, let's face it. Mm -hmm. And our world is a very, very much a strange place than where it's been before. And yet, out there, nature is um, continuing in a way, and uh, it's continuing at speed. And and they seem to be oblivious to us, really. Yeah, absolutely. We're not getting in their way as much, being indoors as much as we are. So I think no, that probably well, helps. Not. No, that, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly right. We're not getting in their way. And. Uh, my goodness, there's been reports of, was it dolphins in the canals in Venice? And I don't know how true these stories are, but yes, we've been hearing some amazing stories yeah. about, you know, the air clearing up and less pollution in the sky and, and all of these things, I guess, is giving Mother Nature an opportunity to breathe, um, considering the circumstances. So, yeah, it's been interesting. But I know we're going to talk a lot about um, bees, um, and I can see behind you, you've got your, your story that we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, tell us a little bit more about yourself and then um, hopefully we can learn more about Tales from Mother Earth as well. Okay. I'm, um, I'm a mother of two young children. Um, in fact, they're growing up quite a bit now, actually. They're nine and 11 years old. Um, and in the conservation area, I've, I've always been very keen on wildlife. I've, I've grown up with um, Sir David Attenborough's programs, for instance, the life on Earth and the planet Earth. And just amazing scenes that he's brought back from around the world. I mean, in fact, Australia is, is a prime example, really, the amount of wildlife you have there and the variety that's over there and the toxins you have there as well. It's, it's quite scary, really, what's over there. Um, but just to see that variety that comes back through our screens and, and, and we see it, um, I've just really relished looking at wildlife for such a long time and I appreciate it and I'm bringing my children up to do the same and it's really important to me. Wonderful and and for those that don't know prior to this you were in the corporate space and so now you've taken the learnings of project management and your experiences in that space and actually bringing them to Tales from Mother Earth. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what is Tales from Mother Earth and why is it so important? Okay well Tales from Mother Earth is um, it's a, it's a concept and it's also a range of um, children's books that we've put together, but it's not just a book, it's, it's more than a book. It's, um, it's a book that's got a conservation message in it. We wanted the stories to be realistic animal, insect and bird stories of how animals and wildlife are, or what they're facing really in, in the current situation and our current lives. Um, how they're coping really in the in the plight of the natural world and how they're getting on out there and we wanted to bring that understanding of, of what's going on in the natural world through to children to educate them but more than that to actually empower them to feel that they can do something about it and they can help the natural world to really connect the two because a lot of people have been telling me for some time now that um, through education really is the only way where we're going to actually be able to reconnect children um, and that generation with, with nature. There seems to be a very strong disconnect now um, and people don't go out and, and, and look at the wildlife in their garden or they don't go out and, and see what's out there. But I guess maybe they don't do that as much because there isn't as much out there as what there was when I was growing up, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. And I think something um, that's really important about this is that this is a quite a unique idea. Um, it's, you know, agility in action, agility in thought. It's bringing together the conservation side, the education side, and then something that kids love, children's yeah. storybooks. Um, and, I, and I know you've mentioned um, previously it comes with a CD as well and you're doing some work with schools, etc. And so I'd love to know what have the response been from the children so far in actually getting to see this product? Yeah, no, thank you for that. Well, all we've been doing is we've been doing um, a lot of um, school assemblies for Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. So it's primary school age, really. Um, the book is aimed at uh, a 3 to an 11 year old, so it's perfectly over, over that age. Um, and really, we've been doing educational story workshops where we um, present the story to them of Phoebe the Bee, um, and that's our first book. And we started with the bee, really, I think, because 
everything starts with the bee. I mean, bees are so important in this world. And so it felt right to start with the bee. Um, but when actually, uh, children actually do our story workshops, um, their eyes seem to get bigger. <laughs> they, they, they take in an understanding um, of, for instance, how long bees have been on this earth and what bees do for us. The fact that 87% of all the plants in the world need pollinators, for instance. Uh, to continue and that gives us the the variety of plants that we have and we consume I mean all the, all the crops for instance um, and it's a realization really that they don't seem to realize the other thing as well that we teach them at our primary school assemblies is um, the fact that how long bees have actually been on this earth um, we actually have a timeline uh, which is almost like a washing line I guess really where we actually peg on um, time dates so it goes from modern day right the way through to dinosaurs and then we have these um, these little clip on uh, Phoebe the bees and we ask for a few volunteers to come up and say right come up and where do you think bees joined us on this timeline from dinosaurs right the way through um, and it's amazing sometimes they put them around the Egyptians and sometimes they put them around the Roman times <laughs> uh, sometimes it's the industrial revolution um, and when we actually show them that it's right the way back and uh, we've been told it's right the way back um, in the Cretaceous period um, and that's when flowers were actually evolving and that's when the insects started to evolve and the bees were around that time um, but they're, they're just dumbfounded they really are and their eyes get bigger and they just take it in um, and then we come right the way back to present day and we kind of say well they've been with us for all this time but it's just this period here where they're they're in decline and we need to help them and what can we do to help them so everybody these are assemblies of it's very clear on what they can do to help them or what what they can actually do um, and take action in, in their back garden or in a flower pot um, growing wildflower seeds to actually make that happen so it's it's really rewarding to us um, and I believe it's engaging to them to actually see uh, what, what they can do and, and to comprehend it um, I mean we start at the assembly really where we're saying you know what animals are in trouble and what can we do to help um, and it becomes very clear very fast really that lots of hands are shooting up and they're saying everything from polar bears to badgers to squirrels to foxes to every and then and it becomes very clear very quickly that it's it's all living beings need our help right now but we we were focusing on bees for that assembly obviously because um that's with the story with Phoebe the bee that we've put together it's wonderful it's a really good story and i think one of the things i love about this initiative is that you're actually practically involving the students in something they can feel they can touch it's not just reading the book but actually being able to practically um, apply some of those learnings that they're, that they're asking your questions they're getting responses um, I think it's so much bigger and broader than just being able to you know watch a documentary but actually being able to be involved in such an initiative um, I think it's a um, it's a really interesting you know you're one of the authors in in the series as well and I know that this is one of many and I know that you're also co-founder how did you come up with the idea? Where were you? What were you doing? Where did this idea stem from other than your love of Sir David Attenborough and conservation in general? Okay. Well, in all honesty, that's where it came from. It was, it was last year um, when I heard um, David Attenborough actually say, and there was a big statement and it was worldwide, and he actually said, the Garden of Eden is no more. We've gone past the point and, and this, is, this is tragic, really. And I just thought I need to do I need to do something I can help and I, I need to do something more with this. I brought my children up to appreciate nature and, and respect it. And so we upped our gain, really. We went out and did more beach cleans and we picked up more rubbish and we planted more flowers um, in the garden. I mean, I've never been much of a gardener, but all of a sudden, as soon as I heard the insects were in trouble and bees in particular, I was out there planting lavender and all the things I could plant in the garden. <laughs> Um, so we just upped our game. We put um, nest boxes up in the woods. We planted in the woods. We we did all we could do. But in all honesty, um, I felt that wasn't enough. I felt I needed to do more. Um, and so I I was talking to a friend, a very dear friend of mine, who is now Mother Earth. I refer to her as Mother Earth. <laughs> um, I was talking to her one evening. She's actually a continuity announcer for a television channel. Um, and I kind of said, we need to do something more. And really, this is where it all came from. And she said, well, Jen, how about, um, she said, we need to write some stories. And, and I said, okay, well, you write the stories. And she was like, no, I can't write the stories. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I'll write the stories. The first one will be about a bee and we'll call it um, Tales from Mother Earth. And really that's how it came about. And within five days I'd written Phoebe the Bee. 
um, and I sent it to her and she's got three adorable children and she read it to them for their nighttime story um, and they seem to really enjoy it. Um, I also read it to my children here and, and my eldest one actually helped me in the research of it. Um, wow. And we kind of put it together. And from there we thought, okay, what can we do with this? And then it grew, really. I've always been into music, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a bit of a singer songwriter too. And uh, when we realized that what we wanted to put together was actually an audio storybook, um, that's also got a very strong conservation message and it's got a page of information. So it's got actually um, action tips of what the reader and and the um, the parents or the guardians of the reader can actually do to to take action to empower themselves to feel better about the situation. We we put those books together and we put the stories together and then we tested them. We tested them on families and we tested them um, on our children and we tested them in nurseries um, and we got really good responses. So then because we'd gone through that agile process, if you like, of iterative development, um, mm -hmm. we took it further. Um, and then I thought, OK, well, if it's an audio book, um, obviously my Mother Earth friend who's got the most beautiful voice is going to be narrating the story. So then mm -hmm. it would touch from we looked at our market, really. We thought, well, it's going to be touching there if she's going to be reading it and it's an audio book. It will be touching from like a three year old so they could do a read along. So we did a read along part a recording also on the CD. So it would be a read along version right the way through to my son's age probably, about 11 years, something like that. So we thought, well, we're really spanning the whole of the primary school um, sector. Um, wow. Then we thought we need music. So I yeah. know um, someone who who writes the most amazing music. So I, I brought him on, on, on board. Um, we need obviously illustrations. So I brought Emily on board and she, as you can see, her illustrations are just stunning. So we <laughs> wanted it to be anatomically correct. Um, yes. You know, a bee, for instance, has six legs. So we didn't want it to have three. <laughs> so um, we wanted it to be as factual as we possibly could be in terms of um, the stories with the plight of the natural world um, and empowering children to really make a difference. So it all came together. So story editor came together. The, um, the music came together. The images came together. The voice came together. And obviously myself as, as the writer, um, five of us in the team. And we really put our our best thoughts to it um, and then more creative ideas came along like the the crossword for instance and the fun facts um, and the fun facts is great because it teaches children to be not just empowered but empowered with knowledge I guess as well the fact that bees have five eyes and they need to be collecting uh, 2,000 flowers per day they need to be visiting uh, to collect the pollen and the nectar that's required and and so they can, you know, it's an educational tool, it really is. And then the other bits we've got in there is a colouring in picture. Um, we've got some information about our next um, story, which is going to be about Spike the Hedgehog. That was going um, to be my next question. What, what, what is uh, coming up in the series? Because I'm sure you've got a lot more ideas. If you can create a book in five days, um, I'd love to know what, what's next. Um, you've got the hedgehog. We've got the hedgehog. We've got Bandit the Blue Tit. Uh, <laughs> got Piper the bat, she's a pipistrelle bat. Uh, we've got Stanley the water bowl and that touches on um, the, the plastics problems in rivers and lakes for instance. Yes. Yes. Um, and we've got another one called the bug hotel um, which is wow. my favourite because I wrote that looking out at my garden and thinking yes. well if there was a few bugs on the wall for instance how would they reach yes. How would they get across the garden and all the different um, environments that they have to pass and dangers that they have to pass to get across the garden? Yes. So yes, I, I just got into a bit of a, um, yeah, kind of an idea in my mind that um, I, I could write that and it, it came together really well. It needs to be edited though, so it's something like about 6,000 words, that one at the moment. So we'll oh, put wow. that on the back burner for the moment. <laughs> Sounds really good. Um, I'm, I, look, I think the first book, I agree, um, makes perfect sense to start off with a bee. Um, I think being the focus and, and talking about the challenges that bees currently have, you mentioned that they are in trouble. You know, what, what are, why are they in trouble and what are some of the things that, you know, we could do or that people listening could do to help minimise the damage that's being done and actually help save the bees? Yeah, absolutely. Well, when I heard that report that um, insects were in decline, that's exactly what I needed to do. I, I needed to do all I could do to to try and help. Um, I don't know if you've heard about leaving a corner of your garden to grow wild, for instance, but the wild flowers that come up naturally, like the nettles and the dandelions and, and things like that, uh, bees and insects 
really adore. They they get a lot out of that. And I think what we've done in our gardens is all become uh, too too clean in a way, too pristine, too to um you know if there's a weed growing we want to either pull it out or unfortunately we will may want to use like a weed killer and, and i suggest don't use weed killers anymore hand mm-hmm. weeding is best or mm-hmm. boiling water can boiling can water yes well mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but i think we've always wanted our gardens to be almost like a, an extension of our house where they're so smart and so clean and, and so um an area that that's that's pristine and really we need to let them go back to being a little bit wild really let that grass grow a little bit more um, and you'll see the variety of insects that suddenly will appear in your garden and that will be using it um, and as well as that plant some um, some wild flowers um, I've got foxgloves in my garden and there's one particular bee that that, that goes with foxgloves um, one of the bumblebees for instance and the foxglove has actually evolved now to only you know the tubular flower that it is to only accept if you like one or two different types of bees which is incredible wow. so that's a symbiotic relationship as well always um bees also need water but they don't need water from a um from like a trough if you like they will need a, a shallow base of water so they can go in and get the water and then um, take it back to the hive you can also get um solitary bee um houses that you can put up in your garden that can encourage bees to come along and uh, and um, you know lay their eggs in there with a little bit of pollen, a little bit of nectar that they put in there, and then the following spring you'll get baby bees coming out. Um, so that there's lots you can do. There really is, but I think it's it's being mindful that your garden isn't necessarily just yours. Um, it it can be a wild place as well, um, and yes. it can benefit the wildlife massively. And I think absolutely. And if- Sorry, Absolutely. Yeah. Those tips that you've just mentioned, there's probably tips in there that some adults wouldn't even be familiar with. So um, I appreciate you for educating us. Um, and I definitely have taken some notes and will um, make sure to pass that on not only to my nieces and nephews, but also to my husband, who's currently in the garden doing some work there as well. The other thing I must mention also, um, Fatima, is the reason it all came about because I'm a mother and because I'm, I have young children. I was very aware that over the last couple of years, the anxiety about their future um, seemed to be growing. Um, yeah. They had this this knowledge that we probably imparted in them in some way in society that it, within 10 years time, it's going to be this way or that way. And uh, with, the, with the climate and the environment and the temperature and and all that sort of thing. And they, they know that they're very aware of that. Um, and there was the anxiety levels, I think, were growing. And so another reason I think for doing this was to to empower them and to calm them really and let them know that they can do something about it and with me if something's out of my control then the anxiety grows but if yes, I'm yes. doing something that can um, that can help and I can take action it's probably a very an agile thing isn't it if you can actually take <laughs> action about it um, yes. it, it, it can help alleviate those and with me because I was saying I needed to do more in that situation yes. When I yes. started writing and I started putting this whole venture together and bringing everybody in that could do it, I felt better because I was doing something to help. And so I think with children, as soon as they feel empowered, whether it's educational or whether it's they're taking action, they can actually feel much better about their future. And I think that's a really important thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. And look, um, I've heard you mention Agile a few times. I know we know each other from um, previous conversations where yeah. you were working um, within an organisation that focused on Agile and, and project management. And um, you've obviously been able to demonstrate um, taking control of your, uh, I guess, your future in terms of what you're doing with Phoebe the Bee and this and this wonderful organisation. You've taken a, a bad situation and actually turned it really good. Um, what are some of the tips you'd have to maybe other people out there currently that are thinking about what they can do next and in, in, in their career paths? Well, that's a big question. I mean, currently at the moment, I think everything's on hold, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> I think at the moment it's just hold on to your beliefs and hold on to your passion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think I think that's really strong. And you're right. Um, out of adversity, amazing things can happen. Great things yes. can occur. Um, and you've just got to keep that positive attitude and that belief that out of something that is so, so bad, there is light at the end of the tunnel, there is a, a silver lining to the cloud, and you've just got to keep your spirits with you and happy that um, 
things can get through. And yes, absolutely. I was I was made redundant from a job that I absolutely adored, and I'd been there almost five years. Um, and so that was really hard to take. Um, but in a way, this idea had come to me what, about four months, five months before that. And so this was in the background and this was being developed and worked. And even if, I mean, I was managing to hold down a full-time position um, with a, a very um, demanding position of running a conference for 250 people, as you know, in London. Um, and that still happened and it was a great mm -hmm. success, um, even though I was still working on this on my weekends and my evenings. So they, they were working hand in hand in some respects, but with the prototype that came to us um, what, late October, November time, um, that allowed me then, I guess, really, because the redundancy was was in process uh, around that time, that allowed me to go out and and put the foundations in place, really, and make the contacts that I that I felt I needed um, for this organisation um, and for Excellent. this venture. And it was really a, an opportunity for me to make the most of that time. And so yeah. I did. I mean, I was yeah. out there talking to people about Phoebe the Bee and our book and we had the prototype so I was testing the prototype as well in nurseries for instance and in primary schools and putting some ideas together with the rest of the team of what we can do when we get to do our um, our assemblies so when we hit the ground running in March which was our month to launch which crazy month crazy months I know in considering everything that's happened but we felt we needed to wait for March because of the spring no one was going to yeah. think about bees or their plight um, in yeah. Christmas time, for instance. And when I was wow. calling people, they kind of said, Jen, sounds amazing, but give me a call in uh, in like January once I've got the grotto up and down again kind of thing for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty, for Christmas, I didn't even want to stop. I wanted to continue. So I was almost forced to um, put everything down and walk away from it for a little bit over the Christmas period. So to be with the family, which was a good thing, obviously. Um, yeah, but I definitely. picked it up again, and um, and we only actually launched beginning of March, when we got the final print run run in uh, February. So we launched in March, and we managed to do some of our events and some of our primary school events. We had so many more planned and booked in the system, and obviously yes. um, that's all um, on postponement at the moment. Yes, definitely. It's it's really um unique and 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 heartwarming to know that you are in an organisation that you actually can be working with your children and you know having their them as effectively you know board of advisors or something you know giving you input into these stories I think that's absolutely fabulous and and like I said you've, you've made made good of a, of a bad situation and um, I think your your project management knowledge and the skills and know-how from that corporate space is no doubt helped elevate what you've been trying to do I mean to be able to write a book prototype it go out to schools and in such a short period of time is is a tribute to, to yourself and your team so um, that's really, really incredible. What um, what else is on the cards? Any secrets you can tell us about maybe some other things you're thinking, maybe in 6, 12 or maybe 24 months from now that you've got on the on the horizon for Tales from Mother Earth? Wow, um, big questions. Um, well, merchandise, I guess, that that's the thing. We're looking at T-shirts um, and all sorts of things like that would be great so people can walk around with BB T-shirts um, and Spike Hedgehog T-shirts. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, I've got to say a big thank you actually to Australia because you guys seem to have taken Phoebe to your hearts, which is just wonderful. And we've had so many orders now from Australia. So there's lots of books um, flying over there. So Phoebe's flying over to Australia quite a bit at the moment, which is lovely. So it's it's obviously, it's it's the concern that everybody has um, for, for the natural world and the empowerment that we can give to our children, which is what we set out to do with this. Um, top secrets of what we're doing. Um, I heard the music the other day for Spike, which is just incredible. So Chris nice. Simon, our composer, um, he's amazing. I mean, there is a secret, I guess, in the respect that he cannot read or write music in terms of visually, you know, when you see the notes and, and everything, the, the bass clef, the treble and everything. Um, but he writes the most amazing music. And when I asked him to write Tales from Mother Earth theme, I wanted it to evoke um, nature and I wanted it to evoke mountains and I wanted it to evoke the sun coming through the trees and the wind that you hear and, and all that. And he's put together this most amazing piece of music that is going to be on every CD, every book that we do. And it's the last one because Fatima, it's just like um, a lullaby. And um, when I tested it, because this is all being tested and we received feedback, another agile trait thing, um, mm -hmm. we tested it and 
they we have a piece of music called Phoebe's theme and the children were all running around like bees and uh, and collecting the pollen and everything that we wanted them to do and act like bees and they love that experience uh, but then at the nursery um the, uh, this lady wanted them all to relax and lie down and so we put on the uh, tales from mother earth theme and they all relaxed and they all went quiet and that for a wow. parent is, is joyous <laughs> <laughs> it's just great Absolutely. that's uh, incredible yeah, and, and it's such a lullaby. And I remember listening to it in the recording studio, actually, and I was almost falling asleep. And that's when I realized <laughs> the lullaby. I was like, we need to, this is just the most beautiful piece of music. It's almost like a breath. It's almost like um, Tales from Mother Earth breathing almost. It's just, it's just beautiful. And we've put that on the end of, uh, of every, um, of every uh, CD as number four. So what we've got on the CD is the full read-along story with the conservation tips that Mother Earth narrates. Um, mm -hmm. We've also got the, um, the, sorry, the full story. Then we've also got the read-along version for the little ones that are actually learning to read with the page turning sounds. So you get to the end of the page and it ding, 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 and you turn the page and then you carry on reading. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a bit slower than the, than the full read at the start. And then we've got Phoebe's theme, which is the music that narrates the, that um, accompanies, sorry, the narration uh, of the full story. And then we've got the Tales from Mother Earth theme. And that's what makes up the CD. Wow, so beautiful. Right that um, it is so much more than a book. And when we've taken it to the well-known bookstores that are that are really excited about it, um, they're not quite sure where to put it because it doesn't <laughs> go into the, the factual kind of um, evidence kind of um, section yeah. of the library. The fact yes. fiction, they're kind of... The non-fiction, yeah. It's a non-fiction, it's fiction, it's a bit of both, isn't it? It is a bit of both. So funnily enough, in one particular well-known bookstore, um, they put it by the um, by the seed bombs <laughs> that they had. So it was, it was it was quite strange. They just didn't know where to place it when they looked into it because it does have so much more than a story, as you know. Yeah. It has the uh, the crossword and the puzzles and the fun facts and the coloring in picture. Because again, as being a parent, I think any parent knows that when you when you tell a child something, if they can do something actively, it will sink yes. in. Yeah, um, absolutely. So and children learn at different rates. But again, if you can give them something to reinforce those messages, uh, it's another opportunity really to, to, to go over those points that are all so important. And so we came up with the idea of putting the puzzles in the book, um, the coloring in picture in the book, um, and also the, the crosswords and, and things like that in there. And the fun facts, that's just, uh, it's just educational really. What they can learn there is incredible. And then they can yeah. go and you know, um, go and uh, talk to their um, friends and, and and the knowledge can continue, really. You must be really excited knowing that your next book's going to come out sometime soon, I hope. Um, yeah, well, we're thinking of autumn for Spike. Um, the, the reason for that is um, Spike the Hedgehog's all about um, the importance, really, of the, spy, uh, the Hedgehog Highway. The fact that yes. because we've all got these pristine gardens that I'm hoping everyone's going to let go wild for a little bit. Which yeah, be for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, we've got, you know, all our gardens are like fenced and the hedgehog needs to get from A to B and they can't really get through um, a fence, unfortunately, or, or trees or, or if, if there's a barrier in their way, they, they can't get through it. And so what we're encouraging in that story is actually to um, to um, get a hole put in your fence, really, and then encourage wildlife and encourage um, um hedgehogs to your garden and then what they can actually do is get from a to b because they need to travel quite a lot hedgehogs people don't realize but they, they need to travel and they're they're night travelers and um they're desperate to get to a to b and so poor spike in the story keeps banging his nose on all these fences posts because <laughs> he can't actually get through so <laughs> again i kind of visualized it as as my area i guess where i live and there are high fences everywhere and so if Spike um, came in from the woods, he you know he wants to get over there somewhere. He's got this desire in him to keep traveling in the night um, and we're blocking his way really. And it's a very simple thing we can do, which is literally just put a, a hole in our fence posts, um, the size of, it doesn't need to be that big. It's probably about, I don't know, 15 centimeters square, something like that, mm -hmm. that will allow his little life to continue happily. Wonderful. So it sounds like as we read the series of books, there'll be like little steps, like a checklist of steps that we need to take. And basically that becomes our conservation action plan, if you like. It does Wonderful. indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot more information regarding the conservation action plan also um, on the website, as you can imagine. Um, yes. And we've also linked up with um, some experts out there. 
um, in terms of some um, some website people that have um, been doing this for a, a long time. I mean, we're we're very um, appreciative, really, that we've connected and collaborated with a lot of organisations and individuals that have been doing this for a number and number of years. Um, yes. And we just feel we'd wanted to join them really in this um, in this conservation effort, and we feel very privileged that we've been able to do that. Um, we've got to say a big thank you to Chris Packham, for instance, when I wrote to him um, and told him about our venture and what we're doing. Um, he very kindly wrote back to me with a quote to go on the back of the book, which was just wonderful, um, all about mm -hmm. pollinators and the importance of pollinators, which um, I was very, very grateful for. Um, and also on the back of the book, we've got to say a big thank you to um, the British Wildlife Centre, which is an amazing organisation here in England, um, who do great things for British wildlife as well. And they're on the back of the book. Beautiful. Oh, you haven't seen the book yet, have you? This no, is we haven't. But you want to look through it. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's very nice. It is very colourful. It stands out. It's very simple to, if you know, for a child, like you said, it's as young as three to actually understand that. And I and I think you said there's a CD in the back as well. And yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, Emily's done amazingly with the images. And when we tested it, we obviously took on our feedback and we, and we changed a few things um, yes. when feedback came back in. But right from the start the images were just beautiful once we um, agreed on on the look of phoebe that we wanted um yes absolutely um, and and some of the feedback came back saying the fact that um the images are so bright and so colorful you're almost in there with it um yes. with, with phoebe yourself you're flying with her you're in the flowers with her um it's and not very a, realistic as well you mentioned you know it's it's the, the number of legs that a bee has it's it's all realistic it's not yeah. cartoon like yeah. where you know you you're never wanted it. yeah absolutely we never wanted it to be a cartoon book in any way shape or form we wanted it to be um realistic um and the, and showing and detailing the realistic plight um of these um of these animals um that we're featuring as well um but it's it's so rewarding as well we have these little bee lines as you can see and it's so rewarding. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Oh, just yeah, yeah, perfect. Oh there yes, yes. Uh, it's Very so cute. rewarding when we were testing this, um, and it was nerve-wracking as well because I went round um, a, a, um, a family house and they had uh, three, four children. Um, I think she was actually um, a nursery nurse thinking about it because she had um, a few children that were like four and five year olds, and they were all sitting there. Um, and I gave them the prototype, obviously the book, um, and oh my goodness, it's so nerve wracking because you've written something, you've put it together, it's your pride and joy and you kind of go, there you go. <laughs> and this child was actually doing the, the bee lines with her finger and it was it was really lovely. And then there was almost a squabble because another child wanted it and I thought, it's going to be ending up in three pieces, but no, we wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's also okay. got to make sure that everybody who's got children at home is purchasing the book, but purchasing one for each child because I think that's only fair. I think so, in all honesty. Yeah, I, I think that would make a lot of sense. It, it really would. Yes, yeah, definitely. definitely. Especially with the colouring books and the, all the other Exactly. Yeah. You, you want to make sure they can do the activity. Yeah, absolutely. But wouldn't it be great, though? I mean, the whole essence of this is is to feel empowered, to go out to your garden or your window box or your balcony, or like, like we said on the back of the book, really, you know, even if it's one flower pot at a time, um, plant some lavender or plant some wildflower seeds. And that's the beauty of the events that we've done because we've we've actually grown um, or made um, like um, um, like seed bombs, and then we actually put pipe cleaner flowers in the top. But then those children could take that seed bomb home and plant the whole thing because it was in an organic pot as well. And that's oh. what we encourage people to do: just go and plant those wildflower seeds, and in three four months' time, those flowers will come up, and then bees will visit those flowers, and then those children yeah. will see what they've done and what a difference they've made. Because if they hadn't done that those bees wouldn't have benefited from the pollen and nectar that's in those flowers. And if yeah, we can be part of that process, then I've, you know, we've done something that's that's really quite incredible. And that's that's what encourages me to continue with this venture because I think it's um it's powerful. And with collaboration, um, with with the organizations that we've connected with and the individuals that we've connected with that have been doing this for such a long time anyway, I, I I'm I'm energized to join them so we can try and make a make a difference out there. Beautiful. You summed it up very well. Thank you so much. I think um, it's probably time to get into some rapid fire questions and then we can find out a little bit more about how we can get more involved. How's that sound? Yeah, no Beautiful. problem at all. Okay. Are you a morning or an evening person? Oh gosh. 
once I'm up, I'm a morning person, I think. <laughs> but then I can be a night owl as well, which probably isn't good, is it? Because if you if you, stay, if you stay up too late, then you're going to be shocking in the morning. Um, I do love the morning, and I feel if I, you get up really early, you're kind of cheating the system because you can fit yeah. so much more into your day. Um, Very and much. You can almost, if you go outside, I guess in the morning as well, you're you're definitely cheating the system because that air is fresher, or it seems to be. And okay, beautiful. And what about other than Phoebe the Bee? What was the last book you read? Running Wild. Um, it was Michael Morpurgo. Um, yes, that was the last one I read. And I literally found that by looking at my son's um, bookshelf. Um, and it's incredible. I don't know if you've read it. It's about no, um, tsunami that happened in Asia, um, Boxing Day tsunami. Um, and it's a story about, um, I should have been saying agile books there, shouldn't I? I should have been saying all the agile <laughs> books that I've known and read over the, over the past years. But That um, would be another, pod another podcast episode where I'm sure we'd love to know more about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've read loads of those too. But yeah, um, the, the one that I've read most recently is, is Running Wild. And it's a, it's a true story, which is incredible, um, about a, a boy who gets carried off into the jungle on the back of an elephant um, at wow. the... Um, at the uh, Asian um, tsunami on Boxing Day, um, and and the whole journey and the experience that he, yeah that uh, he he has on his um, travels is incredible, and how he connects with the animals over the period of time and and what happens to him, and then how he then reconnects with with humans again. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's just quite powerful, quite amazing, and the fact that it's a true story, it's incredible. I've just made a note of that. I'll put it in the show notes as well because I'm definitely <laughs> going to make a note to read that one during this uh, quarantine. I bet it was a small sum compared to the, your other books that are on there because it's not agile. <laughs> well, it's sometimes good to read a you know true story as something that's not you know project management related or agile related just to give it a little bit we of a difference. Um, can't we? Yeah, exactly. Um, beautiful. Um, thank you so much. Um, I guess what I I think our listeners would probably be interested to know is how can they get more involved um, in Tales from Mother Earth where can people get more information yeah they can get thoroughly involved with it actually because on our website which is talesfrommotherearth.co.uk um we have a section there in the gallery where it's our pictures and your pictures um your pictures part is we'd love to see all the wildlife um in your garden in your area so snap a picture and send it in to us at hello at tales from mother earth and with your kind permission we'll pop it on the your pictures um, and it's really becoming like a, um, a gallery, really, for everybody who's who's wants to share pictures of wildlife. There's so many pictures on there of birds and of hedgehogs and of bees and of butterflies and everything. And and we encourage that. We really do, because we'd like that to be a place where people can go um, and see um, what's there from all over the world. But it's not pictures that are c taken from um, like files, if you like, or professional photographers. Yeah. Yeah, so people like you and me going out there taking yeah. pictures of our wildlife and yeah. seeing what we can see. Um, and I, I think that's really lovely. The other thing... I'll be sure, I'll be sorry, sure to, to send you through say, a picture. <laughs> sorry? I'll be sure to send you through a picture. I'd um, love to have a look and send you something over for sure. That would be amazing. That would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you. Um, yep. The other thing we have there, which you'll probably see, is um, lots of pictures uh, coming through now of um, the colouring in picture, actually. So this picture here which is the front cover, but you have an opportunity to actually colour it in. Beautiful. And we also put that out on our social media because obviously at the moment we're all sitting in the houses and uh, if you want um, a nice little creative project for your children and give them you know, 10 minutes of so they, you can get some peace and have a cup of tea or do the ironing or whatever you need to do, just, I think the peace is the important thing. I, I'm yes. a mother and I'm homeschooling. I know exactly what we're all going through. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can give them this. And um, and they can sit down and colour it in, and then again send it through to us at hello at Tales from Mother Earth, and we'd be delighted to put that on our website too. That would be wonderful under the um, the gallery section. So you can really get thoroughly involved with this. You can, and like I said already, I mean Australia is just seems to be. I'm getting emails and, and orders from Australia wanting the book. Yes. So you have a very big concern, I think, and a big heart where, when it comes to wildlife and nature. Um, and bees in particular, which is just wonderful. So thank you for uh, all the orders and all our new clients out there. Um, and it's lovely to receive your emails when you actually receive the book um, and send in the pictures for us as well. So do keep those coming. 
Oh, absolutely. I'm sure our listeners will get on board and, and look at purchasing some of those books. I'll make sure that I uh, get some for my nieces as well. I'm, I'm sure they'd appreciate it um, and make sure that they have some time to um, give, give their mum and dad some quiet time. Or maybe even tell my my uh, siblings around the, the lullabies on the CDs and get yeah. them to get some extra peace and quiet when they need it um, during this sometimes stressful time. So now that sounds really good. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners, a call to action, a piece of advice or a question to ponder? before we close out for today oh goodness um I think it's I think it's really the fact that one person can make a difference and I don't want that to sound twee or or trite in any way um but I do think that's true I, I know obviously Greta Thunberg's out there and, she, and she's doing some amazing things across the world and she's she started this in some respects um in terms of saying that saying but it's it's so true and we we say that also when we're at the um, school assemblies you know, one person really can make a difference. Um, and like, I, I know that Marjuli Island, that guy, he went out and planted a tree every day and now he's got a rainforest out there. And I find that incredible. I mean, totally incredible. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, really appreciate it. And hopefully we can have a chat again uh, in the near future. I'm sure we could have spoken about this much longer, um, but unfortunately our time is up today. No problem at all, Fatima. It's been an absolute delight catching up with you again. Thank you so much. We'll send all the details through to everybody so everyone listening has an opportunity to get involved. And once again, thank you so much for joining us. No problem, Fatima. Thank you so much. And thank you to uh, everyone in Australia who's um, been wanting to get involved and, uh, and been ordering books. It's just been phenomenal. So we really, really do appreciate it. And if they haven't got to you, bear with us. Um, obviously, the post is a little bit slower than usual, but it, um, Phoebe is winging, it, winging her way over there, definitely. She's a busy bee. Thank you so much.